We're not going to read it. But chapter 36 is all about that message of restoration to a people with no hope. It's a message of restoration in offering hope to a people who've been enslaved, a people who were literally dead in their trespasses, who had no hope of going home. And so now you have these people who are, who are essentially dead. And you could even say physically dead from where they were, with where they were living, but certainly spiritually dead. No hope. And so to, to dramatically illustrate and portray this, that God can redeem you and restore you, he takes Ezekiel to this place that we pick up now in chapter 37, which your heading might read, the Valley of Dry Bones. Let's read the first 14 verses here of this. Chapter 37, starting at verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. So I prophesied and I, as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I'll place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Father, guide us in these moments together as we hear from your word. Guide us as we, as we long to, to enter the world of this text and to consider certainly its context, but also as equally important for us today, the application that you, you wish for us. I pray, Father, that you guide us again in these moments. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So the first thing we see in those first six verses is that Ezekiel was led by God to this valley of dry bones. I just want to kind of go back through what we just read. He was led to this place where he's looking around into this valley of dry bones. And everywhere he sees, sees, everywhere he looks, he sees just these bones everywhere. And the question is asked of him, son of man, can these bones live? And what was his answer? Did you hear it? This is it, just to try to interact a little bit, wake you up. He said, only you know, only you know, Lord. I don't know what Ezekiel was thinking at that point. I mean, hopeless, I'm not quite sure, but no, but you know, you know. Can these dry bones live? You know. What I want you to do, God said, is prophesy over them. And I want you to say, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Can these dry bones live? Only you know, God. This is what I want you to say to them. Listen to the word of the Lord. And then guess what? Them bones came to life. The the bones came together. They formed bodies. He heard a rattling. I'll just see. Yeah, well, I'll put put this phrase up. Yeah, them bones, them bones came to life. And he heard a rattling and everything. And they came to life and there was skin and they stood there. 
But what was the problem? There was no breath within them. Now, now this is important. Part of this is a part that uh, is maybe too heavy for some people on a Sunday morning. Nobody wants to talk about this, but there is, this is reality. To, to breathe is to live. To not breathe is to not live. Write that down, that's deep. Th- think about this. To live at birth has nothing to do with the body. But it has everything to do with the breath. If you're born and there's a body, but there's no breath, there's no life. To, to die is not the absence of a body. To, to die is the absence of breath. It, it's so important if we can get what, what was God saying to Ezekiel and to essentially the people of Israel and essentially to us about the importance of breath. And it wasn't just life or death physically. There's something there about spiritual breath. We're going to catch this in a second, but think about other places in the scripture where breath was described. Without breath, there is no life. Is it true spiritually that someone could be alive physically but dead spiritually? That there is no breath of God within them. There is no life spiritually. Is it true that someone could be a Christian and go through the motions of Christianity and religion and appear to be alive, but on the inside, there's no breath? They're dead. And so he said to Ezekiel, I want you to say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they might live. And they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So here was this army of of lifeless bodies. He says to Ezekiel, prophesy over them. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they might live. And the breath entered them, the breath of God, and they stood now an exceedingly great army. And he says to them then, this, this Ezekiel, what I'm telling you, is a, is a picture of the house of Israel. That's the latter part of, the set of Scripture we just read. You were dead in your trespasses. You were lost in exile. There was no hope. You were, you were dead. Not just physically, but spiritually. And my question was, can these dead bones live? W- without the breath of God inside of us, whether you're physically breathing or not, I'm, I'm just a bag of dead bones. And he said to him, can these bones live? Only you know God. And yes, they can live by what? By the word of God and by the breath of God. So this becomes a picture of our lives today. Do do we ever feel today, as they said in the latter part of that text, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are cut off. Have you ever had that feeling of just utter despair, hopelessness? I feel dead. And the key question then is, can these dry bones live? I I believe if you just pay attention, there is death all around us. You can ignore it. You can be surprised about it, but it, it is reality. There is a day of birth and a day of death physically for every person in this room. You cannot escape it. You can ignore it. You can pretend it doesn't happen, but it happens. There is death every day of our lives. We don't think about often the little deaths. You ever wonder why sometimes the little things in life we grieve? It's little deaths. There is death every day of our lives. And it prepares us maybe for the big death. But you can't escape it. I mean, it is death when eight, nine years ago, I was living in the house right here. And I walk my then little three-year-old daughter over to the church to hand her off to the preschool here. And I walked into my office and I did what Vince and I do. I cried like a big baby. I actually sat down in that moment and I wrote her a letter. 
It's a death. Then, no big deal. Then you go to kindergarten for the first time. And I put you on the bus. And some bus takes you away to some foreign place. I never cared at all what happened at that school until that day. I wondered, who's going to tie her shoes? How is she going to know how to, what if, what if she can't open her little juice box? What if, what if she gets lost? What if this, who is going to help my daughter? I'm the one who always helps my daughter. Who is going to help her? And it's death. And then like in a week, she knows the school better than I do. And then they go to junior high. And you're scared out of your mind. Then they're about to go into high school. You're scared out of your mind. And you grieve that loss. And then others, I'm not at this point, others, then they, they go off to college and they leave home for the first time. They get married, they leave, and we grieve. There, some of you are, are retired and some say, oh, I can't wait to be retired, it's going to be great. And then you, you have nowhere to go anymore. That thing that defined you all these years and all those days, you, you don't do anymore. Nobody cares anymore. And and it's death, it's grieving, it's loss. Death is all around. I mean, certainly the news talks about more of the horrific kinds of death, but death is all around us. The question is, can these dry bones live? Is there still life? And our response to this question says everything about our faith in the power of God. Everything. Everything. If we sit here and say, I I don't know, I'm not sure, or if our humble response is only you know God, but I trust in the power of God and what he can do to bring life and hope to any and every situation, no matter how bleak it may seem. Ezekiel's response, only you know, which essentially to me is, I can't fix this. It's not on my time. It's not what I want, but I still have a faith that you, you know, you know. And he gave him two things, two foundational things that I think we should just listen to one more time. Number one, he said to him, prophesy, hear the word of the Lord. This is absolutely foundational. Hear the word of the Lord. If you're lost in in hope, in hopelessness, in despair, in looking around, those little deaths, the big deaths, the horrific kinds of things that are going on, hear the word of the Lord. What does it mean to really, really hear the word of the Lord? What does it really, really mean to hear God? Listening is absolutely assumed and absolutely required. But this is much, much harder than it may seem. Like, I would be feeling great if 70% of you are really listening to me right now. If only 30% of you are thinking about what you're going to do today, later, tomorrow... I would feel pretty good about that. It's much, much harder. We are not good at listening. We're really good at talking and thinking about what I want to say next, but I don't really listen to you. Listening is very hard. Listening is required if we want to hear the word of the Lord. Real listening requires focus. It requires clearing distractions, being present, and to actually be willing to enter somebody else's world. It requires that. If I'm going to really hear you, I have to try to, as maybe the old saying goes, walk in your shoes a bit. I want to understand where you're coming from. The same thing is true of hearing the word of the Lord, the Bible. If I'm going to really hear it, I've got to clear distractions. I've got to focus on it. I've got to spend some time with it. I've got to be present to it and not all the other stuff. And I need to try to enter the world of the text. What was Ezekiel thinking when he saw this valley of dry bones? What was God really saying to him when he was speaking these words to him? What was he saying back then? Because I don't want to jump too quickly to what it says to just me because that's a bit selfish and a bit, um, I, I can get into a lot of trouble kind of areas in misinterpreting the text. Believe it or not, if you're not aware of it, you can make this book say anything you want it to say. You can, you can make it say anything you want in terms of your religious belief, how you believe, whatever. You can make it say what you want it to say. But I really want to enter the world of the text and really listen. What does God want to say to me? It is certainly reading his word. But hear this. Just because you've read it doesn't mean that you've heard it. 
Just because you've read it does not mean you've actually heard it. A lot of us read it already have figured it out. So my eyeball saw it, but it never sunk in. It requires us to really, really, really listen. There's this beautiful psalm. I don't think I put it in your notes, but Psalm chapter 40, verse 6. I just wrote it down here to read to you. In sacrifice and offering, you did not desire, but ears you have dug out for me. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. See, many people can get very, very good at fulfilling the laws of religion. I did all the burnt offerings that were required. I did the sin offerings that were required of me. I I, I offered sacrifices. I did all the right things that you want me to do. But I never heard you. And so even in the Old Testament, which was all about law, we have verses like this that say, "I I don't care about your sacrifices and your burnt offerings, but ears I have dug out for you so that you might actually hear me that you might actually listen to what I want to say to you. Now, essential to this then, I believe, is receiving the breath of God. That This prayer, I don't know that I've ever said this. So I've, I've never, uh, I, I keep a list of, of all the sermons that, that I've done and the, the text that we've done. I've never preached this passage in the time that I've been here. But for... I don't know what we're at, 12 years, I think, something as a senior pastor. For at least the first four, five years, this prayer was my prayer for this church. What, what I used to do on Sunday mornings, I, I don't do this too often. I thought about it this morning, but I couldn't get up out of my chair in the office and drinking my coffee, and I, I didn't do it. But I prayed it from in there, just so you know. But what I used to do, uh, I like to get here real early. If I can get here by seven and just be by myself and, and pray. I used to walk around and touch every one of these chairs. Some of you are still sitting in the same chairs you were sitting in back then. And, and we were smaller back then, and, and, I, and I knew pretty much everyone by name and where you sat. So some of you don't even know that 12 years ago and 13, 11 years ago and 10 and 9, I would pray for you by name with where I knew you sat. And one of the prayers that I would pray as I walked around was this. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they might live. Jesus, come from the four winds, O breath of God, and breathe into these slain that they might live. For me back then, I felt it was such a prayer that our church needed We needed the breath of God within us. We needed to hear what God was saying to us. We needed to listen to God. And we needed to be filled with God's spirit. And so I would pray that endlessly. By row and by seat and by name for this church. I don't do it with that much detail anymore, but it is still one of my core foundational prayers for us. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they might live. And the end result of that prayer and that prophecy was the breath entered them and they stood to life, an exceedingly great army of God. That is my prayer for this church. Not that we would be really awesome church and have tons of people, but that we would be whatever size that we are, an exceedingly great army for God which God don't need much. He just needs a few who are willing and faithful. So come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, because I know that sitting out here, there are many people who, like me, have struggles, have doubts, have worries, have concerns that want to run for the hills and take off. And we need your breath so that we can hold on so that we can stay put. Where else do you hear the breath of God in Scripture? The breath is seen from the opening pages of Scripture. Do you remember? Opening pages. Huh? Were you talking about your son? or <laughs> I thought you were yelling at him. And... Yeah, Adam. 
in Adam. How was Adam formed? Dirt. There was a body, and it was God breathing into his nostrils. You can have a body, but no breath, there's no life. And so, as humanity, we could say, and if you want to think about it, some of you sit here and say, oh, that's just kind of weirdly spirit, too spiritual for me. But I believe with all my heart that when a baby is born in the breath, and they breathe that first breath, that is them breathing in the breath of God, and that is life. It's life. There, there's actually, this is probably way too spiritual or thinking, but the, the Hebrew word for God for is, is Yahweh. And, and there's writings of rabbis in that to say that if you pronounce Yahweh, it's the, it's the, the letters are yod Hey vav He, yod Hey vav He, Yahweh. They said the name of God actually sounds like breath. So when you breathe, you're actually breathing God's name. And what's the last word then you would ever breathe when you die? What's the first word you ever say when you come into this world when you can't even speak, according to rabbis would say, is you're actually speaking the name of God. And when you die, the last thing you do is you breathe, you speak the name of God. That's for free. You can say it's crazy, but I think it's pretty powerful. The word of God is described in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 in one way. I won't read it. It's just one phrasing. Anybody know the phrase for extra credit today? The word of God is described. This book is, it's got the word breath in it. It's God breathed. You get half credit for that extra credit because I gave you half of it kind of, but this book is described as this is the word of God and it is God breathed. All of scripture is God breathe. The Holy Spirit, the, the, the same word is breath, it's wind, it's, it's spirit. The Holy Spirit, in a sense, is the breath of God. Jesus said to his disciples, it's better for you that I go because the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you. The very breath essence of God will live inside of you as believers. So when we say, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, we are essentially trying to waken our minds up to the reality that I am created by God. The very breath of God is inside of me. Everything I say and do, I live to honor the one who put himself inside of me via the Holy Spirit. And I read and I study and I honor his word and I receive the very breath of God. As I study this. So please, I'm not shaming anyone for saying this. I myself have said it. But any time that we say, well, I just don't get this book and I can't read it. And therefore, I just don't read it because it's, it's, it's outdated. It's boring. It's too difficult. You need to understand that what we're doing is we're being totally dismissive of the breath of God that wants to enter into our lives. So is this book challenging? Is it difficult? Yes. But is it worth every amount of effort and work it takes to enter the world of the text to allow God to breathe into my life? Yes. Can we just simplistic, in a simplistic kind of way think, well, I can just wake up, read a couple of verses in some zombie-like state and expect that to fill me with the breath of God and think that I'm okay? No. And so at the end of the day, when I wonder, God, where are you? I'm dried up. I'm, my bones are weary and I'm tired and you're not here for me. I have to admit that I've never actually spent the time necessary that it takes to hear and to listen to you and your word and to allow your breath to fill me. I have to be willing to admit that. It's not God's fault, it's my fault. I've not spent the time listening and hearing the word of God and taking the time to allow God's breath to speak into me. It is so important is the Spirit of God in our lives as empowers us, leads us, moves us. The fruit of the Spirit. You want to know, are you being led by the Spirit of God? Very simple way to ask yourself this question. Look in the mirror today and say, am I more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled than I was a year ago? If I can say yes to some of those things, then I'm starting to grow in my relationship with God and the spirit of God is being moved through me and manifested outward in my body and in my life. But if I'm not growing in my love, in my joy, in peace, in patience, if I'm, if I'm more angry, bitter, upset, I'm not growing 
And I might have to seriously look in the mirror and wonder, am I, am I dying spiritually? Which is, which is silly. Because the very breath of God is right there with us every day. It's available to us. Prophesy to these dry bones, God said to Ezekiel. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to God's word. And receive the very breath of God, the Holy Spirit, into your lives. And take the time to listen and to hear. Listen to these questions as we kind of end this time. Can can God bring what seems dead back to life in us today? I mean, ask yourself this question. Do you believe this? Do you believe that God could actually bring what seems dead back to life in me today? Can God restore our hope when all things seem lost? They're supposed to be doing something right now, so don't just stay here. Everybody's kind of like, so this is the time we just randomly get up and start walking around, you know, (laughs) like, no, they're supposed to. So right here, can can God restore our hope when all seems lost? Can he do that? Maybe more difficult, and this could be another topic altogether, but do we believe he can do that for other people around us? Sometimes it's easy to say, yeah, he can do that for me, and he does it, but the minute my neighbor walks in or somebody, I'm like, not that person, though. They're just a bag of dead bones. Okay, do we believe? If we believe it, then, then it, God could do it for anybody and everybody, even the person you don't like today. And lastly, do we see hope and life and possibility in the midst of the valleys of dead bones that we walk in? All right, I said lastly, but that's a preacher trick to get one more in. I forgot I hand wrote this one in this morning. If you get all that, if you believe all that, if you've received the word of God, if you listen and hear the word of God, if you've received the breath of God, then I would ask you this. Will we then go from here and speak life in the midst of death that we'll walk into today? The word and the very breath of God. Will we speak that life today? Yeah. We we may be sitting here today and we are tired and we are worn. And our hearts might be heavy from the work that it takes to keep on breathing. We, we've made, made mistakes and our hope has failed, failed and our soul feels crushed. But we know that God can give us rest. So we cry out with all that we have left. Let me see redemption win. Let me know that the struggle ends and that you can mend a heart that is frail and torn I want to know that a song could rise from the ashes of a broken life and all that is dead inside could actually be reborn because I'm worn. If if that is your story today, I just want to end this time with a reflection, a song, and, and just listen to whatever God is saying to you. This altar is always open. At some point, if someone's truly dead, they don't care what anybody else is thinking. And if today's the day you want to come forward and pray about anything, do that. If you want to sit at your seat and just let God's word speak, really listen. Take a minute and a half and just quit listening to all the other junk that's in our lives and distractions. And let God's word speak and breathe into your life. And the end result of that, just so you know, ought to then take us to speak life into the world around us. Father, be with us in this moment as we listen, as we, as we hear from your word. Those here today who truly desire to hear from your word, I pray that you guide them in these moments. I pray that if others of us are distracted or bitter or whatever it is, break that in our lives so that we can truly receive the word and the breath of God and go from this place and speak life into people around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.